Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN. We're a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Todd Rogers and Angela Duckworth. Thanks for joining us tonight. FAN's YouTube channel has an archive of over 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Todd Rogers is Professor of Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy School of Government and a behavioral scientist specializing in the science of effective communication. He is the faculty director of the Behavioral Insights Group, faculty chair of the Executive Education Program, Behavioral Insights and Public Policy, senior scientist at Ideas 42, and academic advisor at the Behavioral Insights team. Todd has also co-founded two social enterprises the Analyst Institute, which improves voter communications, and Everyday Labs, which improves school-to-family communications. Angela Duckworth is the co-founder, chief scientist, and board member of Character Lab, a nonprofit whose mission is to advance scientific insights to help kids thrive. She is the Rosa Lee and Egbert Chang Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, the faculty co-director of the Penn Wharton Behavior Change for Good Initiative, and founding faculty co-director of Wharton People Analytics. Angela is also the co-host of the podcast, No Stupid Questions. Her 2013 TED Talk has nearly, I just updated it, 32 million views. And her first book, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance, is an international bestseller. We were proud to have hosted Angela in 2012 and 2016, and we're lucky to have her engagement with our work. And now let's welcome Todd Rogers and Angela Duckworth. I think I speak for both Todd and me to say that we are big fans of fan. Um, and... Um, and Todd, I'm a big fan of you. And, you know, I'm not being insincere when I say that this is genius, a succinct sage guide to writing effectively. And the only one I know that is grounded in evidence of what really works. So I'm excited to be in conversation with you today. Thank you. Me too. I can't believe you have a copy too. I have what? one also. What is going yeah. on? It's weird. Um, now, Todd, I think we're going to have a conversation that includes questions uh, from our from our audience, you know, both live and also those that had been submitted in advance because we are not the only fans of fan. Um, uh, but I think you may have prepared like a little mini TED talk just for us. Am I right? Uh, yes, this one will not have 32 million views, <laughs> but... Uh, it will, it, wear it the is right a dress. That's the key. Oh, oh yeah, it, it, maybe, maybe, but I will start with this. I, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, I am really grateful to fan and Lonnie and Anne Marie and you, Angela, for, uh, letting me share what we've been learning about, about how to write. So busy people read and respond. Um, I'm going to open with just it's a probably probably just a few minutes, like we'll call it twelve minutes ish, of uh, of overview of what we're talking about. And it's this is a book that I wrote with Jessica Lasky Fink, who's not able to be here right now. Uh, and the big question is, how do we write so busy people read, understand, and respond to what we write? That's the motivating question. Uh, I have been working on some version of communicating to busy voters and busy families and busy constituents and busy employees and busy energy users and customers in some combination for 20 years. And Jessica and I, during the pandemic, working with school district leaders uh, and some state and local leaders, realized that we really need to help uh, communicators be more effective when we write to our busy constituents. Uh, have you ever... And right now, unfortunately, Angela, you're the only person I can see. So I guess all of my rhetorical questions are just questions for you. Have you ever been to a meeting or talked with someone and they said, didn't you read the thing? Kind of frustrated that you didn't read the thing. <laughs> I can represent the 500 plus people who are with us tonight and say, yes, Todd, exactly. that has happened to me many times. Have you ever been on the other side of it? Just like incredulous. <laughs> that the answer to all of their questions is in the thing that you gave them and they didn't read the thing. Yes. Okay. Yes. This is uh this is like a recurring nightmare, except for it's real. It actually happens. With that's them. the problem. That's the problem we're going after. So how do we make it easy for busy readers to read, understand and respond to what we're writing? Jessica and my motive in writing this book was to help us help the writer be more effective in achieving their goals. 
Their goal is to communicate, sometimes prompt action, and to avoid just being ignored. But you don't have to think long to realize that in addition to being more effective, it's also just kinder to your reader to write in a way that saves them time. So if I wrote Lonnie a message that takes three minutes to read, but I could have structured it so it would take one minute to skim and pull the information out. I just wasted two minutes of her time. It's just, in addition to being less effective, it's also just unkind. And then finally, again, you don't have to think very long to realize that in addition to being more effective, more kind, it's also more accessible. The median U.S. adult reads at a ninth grade reading level. And when we write in ways that are above the ninth grade reading level, it's inaccessible to many of the potential readers. It's, it's less inclusive, more exclusionary, in addition to being harder, in addition to being unkind, in addition to being less effective. One person actually wrote in one of the sessions I did, lengthy or disorganized writing is disrespectful of the reader. And I just think like we should sit with that. It's not just about our goals, which is my primary objective is to help writers be more effective. It's also just unkind to the readers when we don't write in a way that makes it easy. There are six principles. We're not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to go through a couple just to illustrate. And then Angela will, will talk. So the first is less is more. And we, the way we did this, this whole book is every principle, and I'll send a checklist out. Actually, I think Anne-Marie will send a checklist out through the chat. Uh, every principle is derived from a, a bunch of randomized control trials. Sometimes the eye tracking, sometimes field experiments, getting people to donate or click buttons, sometimes just comprehension questions. This was an experiment that we ran where we emailed 7,000 school board members and we wanted them to fill out a survey. And the first sentence is, I'm a professor. Will you please fill out my survey? And then a bunch of deferential sentences, like you're doing important work. You're profoundly impacting people. I know it's hard. You're balancing things. Will you please fill out my survey? In the other condition, we just randomly assign them. We just delete all the middle sentences. And we say, I'm a professor. Will you please fill out my survey? I know you're busy. We ask people to read both. And the vast majority of people think the original, more respectful, deferential, much longer one is going to be more effective at getting survey responses. But we find is that the shorter one, twice as effective, two times as many survey responses. Similarly, I was working with the, um, I don't know if I can name them. I will say a large federal political committee that is not the Republican Party. Uh, I was I was doing a survey. I was doing an experiment with them where they were sending to 700,000 donors an email asking people to donate. And in one condition, this is what they wrote. In another longer session, you'll look at the checklist and say this violates lots of it, including way too much formatting. It's hard to know what they think is important. Uh, it's it's almost like art because like I like so I don't know what they decided they were going to but so they sent me this and they actually called and like hey we have 3 minutes what experiment should we run and so Jessica and I say well why don't you arbitrarily delete every other paragraph so you just it, you cut every other paragraph so it is incoherent we had people read both and agree that the one on the right is incoherent cuz we arbitrarily deleted every other paragraph we run an experiment increased donations almost 20% uh the, the, the big picture is less is more. There's more to this in the book and more that Angela and I will talk about. But the big picture on this one is just less is more. Fewer words, looks like Strunk and White wrote, omit needless words, but also omit ne only kind of useful ideas. This is the real trade-off. The more you add, the less likely someone is to read and understand. And so there's just a trade-off. The more you add, there's just costs. And the third is the more requests you make, the less likely someone is to do any one of them. So we've got these experiments where when you ask for multiple things, any one of them is less likely to get done than if you just ask for one. And so we need to prioritize less is more. The second is designed for navigation because everyone skims. And this is like the big takeaway is that we write, we are taught how to write well. We are not taught how to write effectively. And effectively means starting with how readers actually read. And then from there, working backwards to how do we make it easy for them the way they read? And the way people read is they very often skim. So we're going to do a little activity. And again, Angela, I'm sorry, you're the guinea pig here. represent everyone. So um, imagine being a parent receiving, I'm going to show you something that, it, that Jessica and I were given at one point by a school district that they wanted us to edit. And you're going to get eight seconds. This yellow bar is eight seconds. It seems like a lot of time. It's not. 
And then it's just going to, I'm going to show you that for eight seconds. And everybody watching, you get eight seconds too. I want you to imagine being a parent on a Wednesday evening, stirring the pasta, two nagging kids in the back saying, when's it going to be ready? And then somebody, one of your kids hands you a printed form that is the thing I'm about to show you. It is a real form that a real district that will look familiar to everyone who works with schools. Uh, I want you to just give it eight seconds, which is not too, not, not, I mean, not a lot, but it's also not nothing. And what do you pull out of it? Okay, so I'm gonna give it, you ready? Here we go. You The yellow bar, it's gonna be a ridiculous task. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you pull out of it? And it's fine if it's just a word or an idea. Uh, COVID-19. <laughs> I, good, that was on my list. I've got little notes here. I'm like, j likely answers include COVID-19, close con what's a close contact? Uh, 10 minutes was a bolded word. Uh, what the school's doing, CDC, some things like that. So this is actually the full letter. And you can see on a Wednesday evening being handed this by your kid, undoubtedly the most important information is school is closed effective now for the next two days. Totally. And it's, it's a, this, this is a real form that you've all experienced during the pandemic as school's closed, parents would show up and they'd feel even more alienated from the school and the district where, where like they show up and the doors are locked and no one told them, but didn't you read the thing? Uh, so what Jessica and I did was we're like, well, why, well, the lawyer said we were not allowed to edit the writing. So what we did was we just added structure. So it looks like this. We just made it so that it was the same information, but easy to navigate for an actual skimmer. And you can see at the top, we put the key information, for those of you who are veterans, you will be familiar with what the U.S. Army calls bluff, bottom line up front. Uh, I love bluff. We can talk more about it. It doesn't work all the time because sometimes it comes off as too aggressive or too direct. In this setting, it worked. And we can talk about organization, how you can work it in. But the idea is here is, is it allows a skimmer to navigate and pull the key. And here's another way of presenting the two. Same content. Same content. All we did was make it easier to skim. The idea here is everyone is, is skimming, so we may as well make it easy for navigators. We've done experiments where we show that when we just add this structure, we actually, in some experiments, more than double the likelihood people read past the second paragraph because they just, they're, they're looking around. Um, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to, there are six principles. These are two. Less is more designed for navigation. Uh, and what we're going to do is send out over the checklist the the checklist over the chat it shows all six of these principles and and we can talk more about any one of them we can talk about any of these but the idea is that the big idea is we should add a round of editing to everything we write where we ask ourselves how do i make it easier for the reader because when we make it easier for the reader it's more effective it's kinder and it's more accessible Big picture is we should, no matter what we're writing, we've got, whether it's text messages, reports, web content, emails, memos, sales pitches, letters to parents, letters to school, everything. We just add around where, we, where we, we take ownership that if someone doesn't read what we send, maybe it's on us. It's not a disclosure task. It's our job is to effectively get an idea or content from our brains to theirs. And the best way to do that is to make it easy for them. So with that, Angela, thank you. Uh, I'll unshare. I feel like you just exemplified the less is more principle right there in a meta way. Um, okay. I actually have um, like, a, 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 I want to come back to that uh, correspondence of which I only got the COVID-19 part and missed, of course, the most important thing, which is, guess what? You have to do something with your kids for two days. Um, good luck to you. Um, and I want to... Um, uh, uh, like dive in a little bit uh, to the, the principles. But before that, I just want to say on a personal, because we we are friends um, and I can't remember how many years we've known each other. But when I met you, I thought Todd Rogers, voter turnout, Todd Rogers, voter turnout. And that's what you had been doing. And that's what you were um, well known for. And I feel like this is a kind of a hard pivot to schools. And so, so can you just give me like a little bit of the origin story of, um, you know, of, of course, like why you wrote this book, but anything else you want to say? Sure. I, I used to be a political pollster. 
And I realized it was a science of behavior change not being used in politics. And so I went to grad school and then I left and started a think tank in Washington called the Analyst Institute, focused on how do we use the science of behavior change to help, in this case, it was progressive campaigns be more effective communicating to voters, persuasion, fundraising, volunteer recruitment, get out of the vote. And then I left politics, returned to academia, did entirely education stuff, never did politics. Let me just say, I think many, can you give me one example of a voter turnout, just to give some, you know, especially for the politically not so savvy, like myself, okay. what's like one so, thing that you did to turn out the vote? Maybe uh, like, so, a hit, like a good one, like a really effective one. Okay. Well, be, I mean, uh, anyone has, who has ever been asked, remember to make a voting plan. What time will you vote? How will you get there? Where are you becoming from? That was uh, originally a paper that I did and then working with the Obama campaign and then the Clinton campaign, like it became a sort of big part of the way the politics, everyone now asks, remember to make a voting plan. It turns out we saw in these experiments with hundreds of thousands of voters that when you add this little battery of questions and more than doubles the effectiveness of get out the vote efforts. And I think like this book and like what you did with Jessica for writing, it's like, I felt like you, when I read this book, I was like, oh, they built on this like iceberg, this like huge base of scientific research. The planning thing is a great example because there's like four decades of research on planning, but nobody had thought to how, about how to like actually do it in the world. I feel like maybe that's an exaggeration. So, so I love that example. Thank you for letting me interrupt you. Uh, like how you translated science into practice for voting. Okay. So now keep going. So then what happened next? The, um, what, one thing that that is interesting about the vote of uh, the voting story is that by running randomized trials showing that this increased effectiveness, it became all like people were super convinced. This is like 2007, 2008, 2009, and it became almost universally adopted on the left and right. And I think that part of it was because the evidence was so convincing uh, by doing experiments. It's not just I'm a guru or a consultant saying this is what you should do. And I, one of the joys of writing, of like sharing this book has been a lot of people will come up to me afterwards and be like, I have been fighting about this for 20 <laughs> years. And everybody always dismisses me as this is a question of taste. And, right. and, and you're like, it, no, it's, it's not. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's really a question of effectiveness. And, and, and by providing the evidence, it like, you know, borrows the, like the, pr- the thing that we think is credible proof in today's time, which is like a scientific approach to just to say like, oh, it turns out that writing so that it's easy for readers is not just a stylistic preference it is actually objectively more effective. Right. Right. And it's not just an art. It is a science. And it's it's like in, and you can read this book, actually, because it's so well formatted. Like I feel like I'm on like Home Shopping Network. Like you can read this wonderful book because it's so well formed. But it's true. Like when you sent me my advanced copy, I mean, I read it in like a shockingly. I was like, oh, I'm done. So um, so 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 which is the whole meta point. OK, so so very briefly, because I want to get practical. But like, why did you decide to do schools? And, and then of course this transition, because this audience, you know, is like anybody who needs to communicate with anybody, but just um, like, how'd you get here? Uh, like, what was your goal? Like, why, why what were you trying to accomplish? So uh, the first education stuff that I ended up doing was on reducing absenteeism in K-12 school districts. And so at the most effective interventions we developed, we ended up starting a separate organization called Everyday Labs that now works with districts around the country, but sends this year will send 5 million communications to families to reduce absenteeism. And we'll probably reduce absenteeism approaching almost, I don't know, half a million, a million days this year. And, uh, and we do lots of randomized experiments. So there's like lots of little experiments on how do we communicate to, there's nobody busier than a parent than parents. And the schools are notoriously not awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. describe typical correspondence with parents. Yeah. Not awesome. Not no. awesome. Okay, right. Okay, so you got here basically from working on attendance, which, by the way, as we all know, holy smokes, that's a whole other webinar, but chronic absenteeism, which is not the fault of everyday labs, you're working against that, but like, wow, you have you have a lot of work to do. Okay, so so Todd, then... um. You know, when when you read this book, you might think, oh, I already have Strunk and White, um, which I do. And, you know, when you might already have like the Stephen King book and like draft number four somewhere back there. I have like tons of books on good writing. What is the difference between good writing and effective writing? So I, 
I love I love the question because we are all taught how to write well, right? Like that is the that is the ideal that's, that yeah, our, that's our, the goal. We're, whether we do it or not is a you know, but but that's what we're supposed to try to do, right? Not right. right. Yeah, right. With with art and style, and and if we're lucky, occasionally beauty, and mm-hmm. uh, but but that is, that is almost like some kind of. I mean, I don't want to get like fancy, like like some ideal of writing. Uh, and what this is effective writing is not beautiful writing. It is right. Practical writing where we have a purpose. And in reality, the most likely thing is someone is not going to read it or skim it, or they are going to read it with the goal of moving on as quickly as possible. So like the New Yorker or your, the, whatever fiction book you're really into, yeah. like th- those are, that's a different reading task. And catch it, just saying. And, <laughs> nice. Oh, and catch but, it. Uh, She's but that, but that's a different task than yeah. actually practical writing. So, like when whether it's meeting notes or sales proposals or an email to parents or a form from any government agency or a, a sign up form if you're you know signing up consumers, any practical writing where people are going as fast as they can because they have they have a lot of things they want to do instead, and so for that which is almost all the writing we actually practically do. Like, I, like I'll do an activity in class where I'll be like, hey, have you ever received a text message and decided I can't read that right now? You look at it and I can't read that right now. Yeah, and it's the shortest mode of communication we do. Don't have like, time to read this text message. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, so you know, like good writing might be going out to a fancy restaurant on a Saturday night Effective writing is it's Tuesday, everyone's hungry, I got to get dinner on the table, like it's it's functional, right? Like you're trying to accomplish something with kindness, as you said, right? Um, uh, and, and usually I think people are trying to communicate things that are useful to the other person, right? So it is truly win-win. Okay, so the very curious... Um, uh, audience members um, have been submitting questions. And then I also had some from it. So I'm going to do a little mix. Um, but um, let's get practical. Um, you mentioned um, texting. What are your pro tips on texting? Whether it's texting or uh, or ri- any other kind of practical writing, people are moving as fast as they can. Often they're... The way that we think about it is there's three stages. Do I engage at all? And very often the answer to that- You're on the receiving end of a text. Yeah, well, as a reader, do I engage at all? I look at it and I say, often the answer is no. And I just, uh, no, not now. Not and I, yeah. And okay. so if you get if you get past that filter, then it's how closely do I read before giving up? And the default behavior for readers is moving on. Like that. Like they, right? Like that's, like that's what you're, yeah. So- yeah. So, so the principles all end up applying to text. We have all these experiments where like you add an extra sentence to a text message and you decrease people's likelihood of responding from a three sentence to a four sentence, from a two to a three. And we did this one experiment with a school, with a very large school district where we texted 20,000 families asking them to fill out a survey. And in one condition, it was, please fill out our survey. We know it's been a hard year. Thanks for sticking with us. The survey link is here. Three sentences. When we cut the middle sentence saying, we know it's been a hard year, thanks for sticking with us, we increase responses on the surveys. So we do an experiment and that and 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 cutting out that, that being kinder by not saying all the other stuff that you were trying to be kind saying. Yeah, but but what I what I love about this, the school district kept the original one, despite the evidence. Wait, after the experiment was run? Yes. Why? Well. Because because the school district's goal is not just getting people to fill out a stupid survey, right? The goal well, the goal signal as well. <laughs> well, no, they want to they want to try to rebuild and repair relationships with families. Like, is it, you know, th- this period has been pretty you, difficult. You might argue that the kinder thing would be to save that haggard, stressed out family time by just sending them fewer words. I, yes, I, but but this is I love this I example. Would. I am yeah. sure totally. I'm 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 often I'm with that, but it really depends what your goal is. And you may have a higher order goal of like, yes, this survey is a little important to me, but the most right. important thing is at every turn signaling we but want to repair. Yeah. That may be, but if people don't read your text at all because they've put their phone down and then it gets buried, that's also buried kindness, right? I, so- 
we don't know what happened in that case. Well, let me, yeah, but let me, let me on that one. I really like, I, I, I love that example because we, Jessica and I used to call it principle zero is that you can't really write effectively without knowing what your goal is. Mm. And if, and if you're, if you, once you know your goal, everything cascades from there and often writing clarifies thinking like, you know, you think your way through it, but that is not the efficient way to get information. To, like you can use writing for the purpose of like clearing your own thinking. But then the next step is, okay, well, what's the best way to get it to the next person? It almost certainly is not your journal entry. Right. Right. And as you know, Todd, I gave you some writing, what, in the last week, I think, right? And I was like, wow, this is a very difficult letter that I need to send out and I have to get it right. And it's long. And uh, and I think I actually did a reasonably good job with the, you know, navigable, you know, less is more. I, but you said to me, what's your goal? And I had not asked myself that question and I had already written the darn thing. So, so I love principle zero. So you mean principle zero because there are six principles, but this is like a, this is like the, the first question you should ask, right? What, what, what is my goal? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and often it is not clear until we go through the whole writing process, but we just need to separate the two purposes of writing. One is clarifying our own thinking. And the other is the like literal magic. I don't mean to sound like fanciful about it, but like, it's pretty incredible. I have this idea. I move, I, I write something out and, and then somehow, your head. And somehow it goes in the other person's head. And to do that successfully, the what we find is that it turns out the easier you make it for the reader, the more likely they are to be able to get that idea in their head. Okay. Um, from the sublime to the mundane, how do you feel about emojis? <laughs> um, I, I, for, uh, so I am all for efficient communication, right? Like we want to make it as easy for the reader as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have two thoughts on it. Two thoughts on emojis. Okay. One it turns out not everybody has the same understanding of what the say a given emoji means. <laughs> uh, so um, the Wall Street the Wall Street Journal had this uh, this survey that made me feel. I mean, I sometimes I forget that I'm 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 not a kid. I'm not a young like person anymore. <laughs> yes, I, I'm just going to say somewhere between not a young person anymore because I include smiley faces as ways of saying like good, happy, agree that this this makes me happy. Okay, uh, and, apparently, so old, and apparently what young people think it, it means sarcasm. It means, it means like Whoa. your, your, what you're saying is sarcastic. Whoa. This is like learning that dot, dot, dot means what is that? What does an ellipsis mean to a young person? I think it means something, but I can't remember like my daughters told me. And then of course, never end anything with a period. I did learn that. Like it's hostile. Right. And sentences with a period. I was like, "What?" Right. So, so, okay. so, like, like we, like, uh, in in it, we want to be able to efficiently communicate with people. We want to make right. it easy for the reader, but we definitely don't want to insert ambiguity. And you think emojis may be particular? I mean, obviously, you can step on minds, you know, in this minefield of young and other differences. But like, but but okay. So sometimes emojis can lead to more ambiguity. Um, Can I, yes. And and so I, I just think that's interesting. Like it turns out that, that not everybody agrees on what different emojis mean. So be careful. Can I show you the second point? Yeah. yeah. So, I'm gonna show okay. It. So, um, hey, visuals. so here is a real sign that, um, that is in a real park in North America. It won an award from the center for plain language. <laughs> it, the, the award is called the WTF award. It's, it's a, uh, it's a annual award that stands of course for words that failed. Yeah. And I'm going to read it. It's written at a college graduate reading level. Remember the median U S adult reads at a ninth grade reading. I don't level. Know if the median college graduate would know the word pursuant because <laughs> I'm not sure well, I know. <laughs> so, Persons shall remove all excrement from pets pursuant. One of the one of the six principles uh, is make reading easy. And that means shorter words, shorter sentences, familiar words. And this uh, and this is not easy. So, like, think about the three possible 
impacts this could have. One, I'm walking my dog. I have no idea what some of these words mean. I move on. Second, I know what these words mean. I see it. it I'm just deterred because it's like, it's like, they're no, they d- clearly, it's only written for lawyers. It's not even right. written for humans. And so the third is like, I'm walking my dog. And for some reason, I, I take the 32 seconds it takes to just read those words and the extra minute and a half to make sense of them to figure out that my, I'm not supposed to let my dog poop. So what, like, how would you rewrite this? Jessica and I propose something like this. Scoop your pet's poop, right? Re- really straightforward. We also use formatting and like navigation. We The law number nobody cares about. Even the person who wrote it doesn't even probably remember what it, what number it is. Yeah. But it's probably got to be up there for right. compliance. Legal thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so we use we use font size to draw attention and make it navigable. And then I had some student, I had a student from France who sent me this. And this is where like, I don't know if this is an emoji, but like <laughs> even I don't read French, but I'm pretty sure this means scoop your pet's poop. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's like, yeah, if we can, I, I know now probably some young person on this is like, oh my gosh, they think that's an emoji. It's a picture. So <laughs> emoji exactly. adjacent. Um, okay, good. So 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 emojis, again, you, you might want to think like, like, will this communicate my message, right? I think is like, that's the underlying principle. Um, uh, another question, um, which is about social media. Um, and I think this is somebody who read your book, but basically wanted to know whether the principles you wrote about, like, do they all export to you know, social media, um, or would you, you know, want to say anything in particular about posting on social media? So the um, social media is just another form of writing in that your reader is trying to move on as fast as they can. And uh, I, I, we have a paper coming out where we ran a bunch of 31,000 experiments with the Washington Post where we randomized the words used in headlines. Hmm. And when you put an unfamiliar word or a hard to read word in a headline, people just skip over it as if they don't even read it at all. Hmm. Uh, and so like in this infinite which scroll- is, Which is how young children, when they can't uh, read a word, they like they skip it, right? And then of course they're possibly trying to use context. And that's adaptive in general, but not if you're the Washington Post trying to get people to read a headline. Right. Sure. Yeah. And then there's there's a bunch of research that like if you if you write in complex grammar or unfamiliar words, if you raise the reading level from fifth grade to eighth grade reading level, that you decrease the likelihood holding content constant, you decrease the likelihood to go viral. And so but but I like again, I it all matters what your goal is. So if your goal is to, like in social media, it's not the efficient transfer of let's meet at on Tuesday for lunch. It's like you're trying to be amusing often and whatever, like right. whatever you, you get, you start with your goal and then within that constraint. So there's my favorite the the we cut it from the book because Jessica, my co-author said it made me old. Um, oh, now I totally want to hear it. This is great. This is like the director's cut. What did you cut? Yeah. Well, good. Well, I mean, Jessica couldn't make it so I can, I can share it. Cause I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, Macaulay Culkin, she thinks Eddie referenced Macaulay Culkin dates me. It does. Uh, but so I, for, I, I get you. Go on. Home Alone 2, <laughs> where are you going? Uh, so for those uninitiated, Macaulay Culkin uh, starred in Home Alone, the whole, several of them, not all of them, actually, he got replaced. <laughs> but uh, he he put a tweet out on his, uh, that is the fifth most forwarded, most retweeted tweet of all time. And it says, want to feel old? Question mark. N- space, empty line. Next line is, today I'm 40. <laughs> and this you know this was he's he's much older than 40 now but i it's funny because uh, right because like we watched him right when he was like an adorable six-year-old or something right that? Yeah, yeah that was it yeah, no, yeah. he didn't cover his own eyes oh, yeah oh, does he but, do that? Okay. but the uh but like if his if his goal was like the efficient transfer of information he would have just said today i'm 40 which is not as funny <laughs> okay that's helpful um email subject lines Wait, hold on. Sorry, sorry, but Angela, what? am I right or is Jessica right? Did that, did that does that belong? I mean, does that? Yes, of course. But you know, some of your readers are going to be of a certain generation, and they're going to love that. Um, I mean, you know, people like us made that go viral. So um, she was probably right, but I like it. I, I, um, that's a good heuristic, honestly. That's that's a reasonable heuristic. She's right. <laughs> that's a good heuristic. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so email subject lines, um, you know, like go. <laughs> uh, it is often people, this is a question I often get is like, what's the best um, subject line because we're trying to optimize reading and engagement. Yeah. Remember stage one is do people engage at all? And stage two is if they engage, how intensively do they read? And the subject line is like a way of getting past stage one often. Right. And I, I there's no reason you would know this, but I'm going to ask anyway, do you, because I worked in 08, Obama innovated this like small dollar fundraising. Barack Obama running Senator Brown. No, Senator Barack Obama was and is. No, but I, I, I if I have to introduce McCulloch, if I have to introduce McCulloch and Culkin, just mostly. Okay, go on. I'm following you. Just want to say I'm tracking. Okay, but but if I have to introduce who Macaulay Culkin is, I don't know. I I don't know young people maybe. maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so okay. Uh, Obama raises lots of money. He's famous for being good at digital online fundraising. Okay. Do you know what the most successful subject line was in that uh in that election um yes you can uh, no i have no idea there's no, so uh, people who are there definitely are people in the audience who who know, who know this because it's sort of like digital marketing people love it lowercase h e y really hey. yeah lowercase h e y hey 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 uh, who who sends you subject lines that are just hey yeah uh, wow I, so, it's so shorter than a three letter one syllable word that, and the and so, the lowercase probably made a difference too like I don't know what the meaning of uppercase h e but like yeah interesting no but so 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 the, actually the story gets oh Lonnie put it in the chat she knows lowercase <laughs> h e y that so that that like. That dominated because in that, what we might call like equilibrium, people were not like organizations and nonprofits and, and campaigns were not having informal subject lines. Over the next three or four years, everyone mm. sent informal subject lines, mm. at which point they stopped being effective. Right. Oh, wait, and, so the pendulum swing the other way because now there's like saturation of that. So so what are what are the most effective subject lines now? It, 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 I mean, there's, it, it's, it's a moving equilibrium. It depends what everybody else is doing. And yeah. so there, there isn't the way that story is that there yeah. isn't a there best isn't a magic formula, right? Because you, you're, you're also like in a market, so to speak. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so with, when we think about subject lines, like it, just like, like, like everything, it's about how do you capture attention long enough to convey your information. And that, that hey subject line was honestly deceptive. It like, yeah. If it worked, it worked because in the first stage of do I engage or not, people thought maybe it would maybe Barack Obama was emailing me. Okay, so I'm going to give you my like not favorite subject line, but if you asked me to write like an email to one of our busy friends, Richard Thaler, Richard Thaler is kind of busy, like as people who win Nobel prizes are. I would write in my subject line all lowercase because I generally write in lowercase again to commute. What's my goal to communicate that we're friends. Hello. So I would write my subject line in lowercase and I would do QQ for Thaler, right? Like, and QQ is actually shorter than, Hey, right. And I think it's signaling, like, just read this because I'm making a request. That's the question part, but also it's going to be quick. I promise. And then I would put his name in the subject line so that he felt some personal accountability, right? So what do you think about that? QQ for Thaler. I mean, now that Angela Duckworth does it, everyone's going to do it and it's going to stop being useful. <laughs> no, but no, but like, I, like it, 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 I've never gotten a QQ Rogers. And right. so if I, I saw would, it- For you, I'd do QQ for Todd because I call him Thaler, but I'd be like QQ uh, Todd. You know what I mean? QQ for Todd. Oh, maybe I'll search during the during the I break. I have sent you an email that's QQ for Todd. I, I believe I believe it. I so so but but it stands out. Like that's that's the idea. It's just it stands out. Uh I, I also like there, there's another dimension of like so the reason I, I like that question is that it really conveys like it's really about capturing attention and it's getting people to engage. And in that case, I think the subject line for you is not deceptive, but I do think, hey, if it works, it's it's because people think it may not be it. Barack right. Obama asking me for money. It may just be, hey, he wants to like meet up. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It could be. That's, that's very possible. 
even if you don't live in Chicago or have anything to do with Paul, it could be. Um, okay, there. I'm trying to find the center of gravity in the many questions that are people asking. I think one recurring theme, um, and uh, and there is uh, a question on my mind too. Tell me about AI, um, especially generative AI, right? Like these new tools, probably most famously ChatGPT. I saw in your PowerPoint you are making use of the visual you know, generative AI dolly. Um, so, you know, yes, no, what's the future? Like, I think you built a little chat GPT bot, like go. So, uh, AI, these large language models are trained on how we write, like the, the writing that exists. And so they're very good at writing the way we write. And our, our like approach is, is if we want humans to read it, which may not always be the case for every communication, but if the goal is for a human to read it, you need to make it easy for the human to read. And so this is how you make it easy for humans to read. The LLMs like GPT-4, like ChatGPT or things like that are not good at that yet. They, they easily could be. But so with a computer science colleague, we actually trained a um, GPT-4 you know, OpenAI's most advanced GPT on uh, on the tools, on the principles. And then from there, uh, we gave it pre-post examples of emails. And so we have this little tool that like has 60,000 users just in the last couple of months. It's like, it's- yeah. I, so you, I used it, like, let's keep going, yeah. Uh, so it's, you go to writingforbusyreaders.com and then the AI calculator, the AI for busy readers. And I will- um, let me, let me see if I can move. How do I get this? There. Uh, I'll do that. There. So you go to the webpage and there's a little video if you want to watch it, but I'm just pasting here a little example of an email. So here's an email that I like to show where it's like, it's well-written, but it's basically like, hey, let's be better at meetings. Before meetings, prior to meetings, do this. Within meetings, do that. Like meaning during. Subsequent to meetings, do that. And then if we do this, we'll all be better. Okay? So you hit submit. And we're going to hit it a couple times. Anyone who's played with these things knows that like they, they, don't always, they don't always follow the rules. But here, the goal is it's making it skimmable. Mm, yeah. Same content. Yeah, it's really not... a job of both of the principles that you said. Right? It's not... Yeah, it's not summarizing. It's important. Like, there you think you can ask it to summarize. It's not losing information. It's just making it navigable. Yeah. Okay. So, and it cut the words, but let's, I want to, I want to do it again. There's something that there's a little sub principle that it's sometimes that there. Uh, no, I don't like that. Let me, let me start it over. About, like, uh, just, you know, hitting the button again, like just asking it to do it again, but you're right. It does. It's cause it's got a, it's like pulling from a distribution, right? Oh, the bold face. No, I don't like that either. I don't like that All right. one. There's said there's one specific thing I want to show. So when it does bullets, one of our little sub principles under the design for navigation is you should have titles. If a bullet is more than 10 or 15 words, mm. it, do it, it doesn't help the skimmer skim unless the title, unless it's the like bullet no longer a header, if it's like a sentence. Like, right. And, yeah. and so you, so you add a bullet if you, so what it'll, it'll show you, it'll give a little, like sometimes it'll, it'll produce it. I, uh, Let's see, maybe here. Yeah, there you go. Um, so it gives you a summary, so it's easy to skim, right? So yeah. I get what preparation is. Next, share your idea. Well, what does he what does he mean? Compile and then go down. And so well, whatever. It's it's just the tool is very, it's fun. It's like people use it all the time. And I get examples uh from people of like either incredibly convoluted or just like beautifully written, long, hard to make sense of emails uh, that they'll then read through this or the things they're writing. And it's, it's just great. I like it as a coach. When I teach this, mm -hmm. this ends up being part of the sort of like 24 seven feedback that it only takes a few times to really become comfortable with. So if you use, if one uses this tool, um, do you think that it will make us worse writers because now we're lazy and our writing muscles are weak and whatever? Or do you think it will make us better writers because we'll have examples of what effective writing looks like? You know, I, I thought about this. We should get rid of all typewriters and computers because our handwriting has gotten so bad, Angela. 
No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I, okay, well, I, I actually has, but uh, I, I like, I don't have a, I'm not sort of dogmatic on this. Like, yeah, I, I, I want us to free. I want writers and readers to have more time to do the things that they find fulfilling. And that means if we, if I have things I want to convey to you in some written form on Slack or in a memo, it's not I want cheating, to, right. It's like a washing machine. You're like, it's better to have a washing machine than like beating your laundry on a rock in the river. Why not use chat GPT for? Yeah. I, have- I mean, in this case, like you, so the, I, I wrote an op-ed on this where it's like, we set, we know the context. So it doesn't know the, I mean, it doesn't know the social context. We yeah. have set the goals. Yeah. We're in charge. of all Yeah. We things, set the right? goals and, and, and we, uh, we know the context, we know the background, in, like the norms of how we communicate. And we set the goals. Like, I don't, I, I not, I don't care. It's not dogmatic to me. We still need to learn how to think clearly, which I think right. we, we may lose. Can't ask us, like, it, it can't answer the question, like, what is the goal, right? Like principle zero. So yeah, I kind of feel like all this like doomsday stuff about, I'm like, what? It's like Excel or a knife or like a hoe or like any other tool that's been invented. Better get figuring out how to use it. Um <laughs> Otherwise, everyone else is going to be using a hoe, and you're going to be digging dirt with your hands. Um, Wait, can, can I can I take this? Uh, I only as like the norms and context. I think are are uh, uh, something I want to. I like riffing on on this. We have a whole yeah, section. Yeah. The final chapter is about our words ourselves, which is like um, we often we are read. We can be read differently. You know, you're a woman, I'm a man, and women are expected to have more exclamation marks and, and smiley women. faces. And if you don't, you can come off, you and I saying the same thing, you may be read as too, more aggressive and direct than me. It's yeah. it's it's so unfair. Afraid, my text message, you know, the results could be catastrophic. <laughs> That's right. If I put a period, it's just that I'm old. Yeah, uh, exactly right. Um, so, so like, what... Eventually, you know, our large language model co-pilots will know who we are and what the norms are, but there are different people are read differently and it's unfair, it's inequitable, uh, and but it exists. And our our goal, Jessica and I, in, in this book is to help you, whatever, in wherever you sit in the relationship and dynamics you sit in, be more effective. And you know the context. So like there isn't a right answer. Yeah. Well, uh, only you know. But that said... I do want, um, oh, I see you just wrote something that literally just came out on chatbots that's in the chat now. Um, oh, well, I didn't just write it, but yeah, I thought it was dumb that the New York City public schools were like banning chat GPT. And I'm like, gee, I wonder who's going to win this cat and mouse game, 16 year olds or like, you know, the slightly older people who run the New York City public schools are like, hmm. So anyway, I thought it was naive. And like you, I feel like it's a tool. We should embrace it. We should, you know, we're still in charge of the tool. Like I, I really, I, yeah, I thought that was dumb. So I felt compelled to write this. Actually, my colleague Lyle knows a lot more about this and he felt compelled to write this and I wrote it with him. So I should get yeah, him- I- I, I, I like that. I um, I mean, the way I think about this, this is this is just helping us be more effective. We're setting the goals and the specific content. But but I want to go back to the bluff, bottom line up front. I love the US Army and since then the rest of the armed forces and you know basically everyone affiliated with the Pentagon uh has this basic like norm that the first line is the bottom line. Oh, and yeah. and that means if you are a general communicating to an enlisted person. First line is the bottom line. Yeah. But but more importantly, or maybe just as importantly, but but also just importantly, if you're an enlisted person communicating to a general, bottom line is the first line. And yeah. so when you are lower status in the hierarchy, you are t- you if you if you don't have a norm like this, you have to do a lot of throat clearing, which is why yeah, right. it's and so and so you become less right effective. That there's a norm. This is like hats off, right? To the to our friends in the military for this amazing rule. Right. And so, but like, it, it's like, it, it makes it more effective for everybody. We know where to look and we know where to write, right. but it also helps new people in the organization and lower yeah. status people in the organization be more effective in, by di- making yeah. it unambiguous, this is how we write. Yeah. 
No, I really love that. Okay, I think I have an exception to the less is more. Let me let me see if I can pitch you. So when um when you get yeah, Angela, 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 okay, man, I, I, before before you change stuff, I just want to like can I pull the thread on that one? Which oh, is yeah, we, pull the thread. Go. We, yeah. We need to have explicit organization in our organizations, which is like the, the the next thing that we're starting to work on. Is like at minimum, we just have an explicit discussion about how do we write, and it's not obvious there's one set of norms that are right. But like mm, right. if by, by making it unambiguous, you help lo especially lower status people and new yeah. people to the organization, but you help everybody. Okay. So that's yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. No, I like yeah. that. I like that. Right. Why, why make the rules in like invisible ink? Right. Um, so, okay. So remember the COVID-19 parent letter that I didn't read and therefore I didn't know that my kids are not going to be able to be in school for the next two days. Um, and then you showed me another version, right? Like I wanted to ask you about FAQs, right? So like there are headers and then there are FAQs, right? And I have been minorly obsessed with FAQs for quite some time. And I even found this like really old study done in like 1998. They randomly assigned in two conditions, like in one condition, it was like a memory task and you're supposed to like remember all this trivia and you're like, oh, you know, the tallest, you know, like uh, animal in the world is this. And, you know, the Mediterranean Sea is this many. And like, and then the other one, it just had the same exact information with more words. So more, right. So the same answers, but then it had an FAQ in front. It's like, what is the tallest animal in the world? Like, you know, how big is the Mediterranean Sea? So um, in research that our common friend, Katie Milkman and our um, collaborators um, are doing, um, including Erica Kyrgios, who I know you also know, um, like, we are finding that the addition of words in that very specific case, like adding a question before the answer um, is awesome, right? So I'll spare you all the statistical details. What do you think about FAQs? Do you find them to me like they're like curiosity inducers? Um, and I think there's a reason why so many products like have FAQs um, instead of just like, here's the same information without the questions. What do you think? Uh, you may remember that when I got married during the pandemic and had a Zoom wedding, that the announcement that you probably received was an FAQ. Uh, I, 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 I love. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I, I love them. Uh, I, you you're, there's a lot of things going on there, right? Like it's not the same cognitively, like it, it, substantively, it's not the same content anymore. You're now mm. creating like, well, you know, an information gap where it's like, oh, the, what is the tallest mountain in Africa? Right. Yeah. And so like it, it ends up being cognitively a different thing. It also is not normal yet. Mm. And I, my, I do, I do think that as things like we often study, a lot of things we study end up having a novelty effect. Right. That over time, if they stop being novel, then we might be confusing what it'll, the mechanism it'll is. It'll either be a fad or it'll be Taylor Swift. <laughs> I don't know what that means. What does that mean? You know, forever awesome. <laughs> I I love that being a place where we end. But uh <laughs> Hi Lonnie. Hi Angela. Hi Todd. Lively, lively. We sold it correctly. Um, I wanted a couple things first, Angela, thank you so much as always, just uh, so on spot, so ready. The give and take is always just top notch. We love you and can't wait to welcome you back yet again and again and again. So thank you so much, number one. Number two, clearly with the great questions that came in ahead of time, there are almost 60, 70 questions that came in on the registration form. Another, I don't know, 40 or so, 50 that came in during the event. Clearly, Todd and Angela, but Todd in particular with this book, are sparking a lot of people's thoughts, a lot of questions, a lot of great stuff. How can you spend yet another hour with Todd? We have a solution. Uh, Todd is going to do After Hours with Fan. It's going to start at 8.05 p.m. Central. It is a separate Zoom meeting. How do you get to come well, you buy a copy of this incredible book, and I didn't even really go into my little personal narrative about this book. I love this book so much. I was completely both shamed and thrilled by this book. Um, and I I just, wow, it, it just changed. I told everyone about it. Love this book so much. Read it cover to cover when I got it as a galley. Love this book. So what we're going to do, come to buy a copy of the book. We've been putting the link in chat, how to buy a book. You got to get it from our bookseller. In the email receipt is a link to register for After Hours. And Fan, because we love this book so much, we think everyone should own it. And everyone you know, plus a friend, should have it. We are giving away a free, a second copy free to anyone that shows up at After Hours. What a deal. 
What a deal, deal, deal. Courtesy of fan. Please come buy this book. It I don't even know how you're life. doing this, Lonnie. I don't even know how you guys can afford to do that. That's awesome. You know, it's from generous vote um, donors who help us do this. Okay. Um, we do appreciate it. We believe it. We like books. We love giving away books. But I'm going to get to the question where it's 756. Todd, I got a question, a tone of which both has been threading through both pre and during event. People want to know, um, so how can you, they, they're in it, they get it, less is more. However, the sticking point, I think, for folks is, well, what about, like, compassion? Like, what if you want, what about emotion? Like, what if you need to kind of, you want to convey, and can you really, unless you're a poet, can you really get there in two sentences? So particularly the specific question, what tips do you have for conveying compassion in a short message? Uh, two things. First, if you join the after hours, there is a chance I will show the FAQ wedding invitation from the pandemic. Uh, there you go. Order the book. What else you got? What else? I got. I got to use that five minutes to go get permission. You get the guns. Uh, What's next? <laughs> Better ask permission first. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not promising. I'm not promising. It's a tease. Oh, Who knows? God. We know, but uh, um, the. So, so there is, it is, it is a, there is a risk when you try to cut words that you cut warmth and like that you're definitely at risk of that. There is an easy way to make sure you don't, which is to make sure that you continue to be warm. Uh, it's, you just have to be intentional about it. The, but, but the, like, instead of three sentences about how wonderful it was to run into you the other day. It can, you can say it was wonderful to see you yesterday. Uh, let's set, uh, we talked about setting up a lunch. Let's, how, how do these times work? Uh, th but there, it, it, it is just has to be intentional. Like, uh, and again, it all depends on what your goal is and what the norms are. Like I have collaborators with whom I don't say, I, I hope you're, I hope you had a good day. Right. Uh, instead, it's just like with Jessica, we're just like, we should have added this or I wonder about this. But with someone else, it'd be like, even though I saw them in the office yesterday, I'd be like, it was so good running into you. Uh, so like different norms. But the idea is, you, I mean, you, you have to know what your goal is and what the norms and expectations are, but you do have to be intentional about it. All right. We're at 759. So this is quick lightning round. First point, um, a good friend of fan, Gail, is letting us know that dot, dot, dot means that the reader is mad at you. So Thank FYI, you, so if you get that dot, dot, <laughs> dot, beware. I'm going to put it in my subject line to Angela, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I'll see what that does. All right, and then the last question, we're going to be quick, and this is also something that came up a couple times. Uh, they want to know, so if you really only want like one question per thought email, is it better to send one email with multiple pieces of information and questions or send separate emails each with one subject per email? So do you want like three emails from Lonnie in 30 yeah. seconds, or do you want one email with the three questions? Go. In the same way that we said with organizations, you should dis you should have a discussion about this is how we write. It's heterogeneous. I like one question per email. Angela, do you like all of them in one or do you like them stacked? Um, I think I would like one email with 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 the three, but I completely agree. Why don't we agree on what we like and then it'll all be good. Yeah, so so we've done surveys on this. 75% of people are with Angela. They all want it in one. 25% are with me. But, but yeah, so as always, uh, Jessica and Angela are usually right. So sure, uh, you win, Angela. <laughs> and and for no done. reason, for no reason, it turned into a competition and you won. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I feel so relieved. I'll sleep better. Angela won. Yay, nanny boo boo. All right. Um, Angela, thank you so much. 8 p.m. I promised you like a Swiss watch. We are D-O-N-E. Can't wait to see you again, folks. We are going to welcome Todd back at 8.05. We're going to give him a break. Come buy that book. Come hang out. As you can see, it's going to be jolly fun. Thank you so much, everyone. See you soon. Good night, everybody. Yeah.